Monopoly Revealed, the remarkable story of how a game in the public domain became monopolized. Most of what follows is based on the book The Monopolist by Mary Pylon, published by Bloomsbury in 2015. Somewhere in the attic basement or storage area of almost every home is a box containing the board game Monopoly. Generations of children learn how to play this game from parents, older siblings, relatives, or friends. Since the game was first produced by Parker Brothers in 1935, more than 275 million games have been sold worldwide. Monopoly is available in 111 countries and in 43 languages. The longest Monopoly game on record lasted for 70 straight days. The story of how the game came to be created, the story as told by Parker Brothers in 1935 and today by the current owner Hasbro, credits this man, Charles Darrow, with coming up with the game idea by himself. For quite a few years I have been aware that this story is a lie, that the game of Monopoly was in its earliest rendition not called Monopoly at all. The game was created by this woman, Elizabeth McGee, in the late 1890s. She called her game the Landlord's Game, and this is the board she designed and included in her patent application in 1904. Notice the many resemblances to the board design of Monopoly. Who was Elizabeth McGee? Mary Pylon tells us that from an early age, she was a devoted follower of Henry George, a passion she acquired from her father, a friend and supporter of Abraham Lincoln. Lizzie, as friends referred to her, read Henry George's book Progress and Poverty as a young woman and thereafter devoted herself to the teaching of George's principles. As Mary Pylon writes, The early seeds of what would later evolve into one of the most popular modern board games of all time had been planted. Lizzie's family moved to Washington, D.C. around 1890, where she joined and became secretary of the Women's Single Tax Club. In the evenings, after work, she taught classes on Henry George's system of political economy. Mary Pylon explains what came next. But she wasn't reaching enough people. She needed a new medium, something more interactive and creative. She began working on the landlord's game, describing it to her activist friends. It is a practical demonstration of the present system of land grabbing with all its usual outcomes and consequences. It might well have been called the game of life as it contains all the elements of success and failure in the real world and the object is the same as the human race in general seems to have that is, the accumulation of wealth. How the game was played has a familiar ring. Lizzie's game featured play money and deeds and properties that could be bought and sold. Players borrowed money either from the bank or from each other, and they had to pay taxes. Two years later, with some design changes, the Landlord's Game was produced by the Economic Game Company in New York. Lizzie was listed as a part owner. Across the game board were references to the real world and to the insights she obtained from Henry George. Land on Lord Blue Blood's estate at the top right of the board and the player was sent to jail. Make your way round the board to the bottom right corner and a player collected wages of $100. The message read, Labor upon Mother Earth 
produces wages. While Lizzie waited for the general public to discover her game, the game was taken up by the residents of Arden, Delaware where many of the first generation residents were also devoted to a practical application of Henry George's principles, calling for the community ownership of land. Much of the funding to purchase the land for Arden came from another follower of Henry George, the Philadelphia soap manufacturer, Joseph Fells. Arden attracted many progressive, artistic, and reform-minded persons in its early decades. Among others, Upton Sinclair spent some time living there after fire destroyed his community in New Jersey. One of the Arden residents carved this version of the landlord's game board in wood, which was featured a number of years ago in an episode of The History Detectives. The board is owned by a descendant who still lives in Arden. Another visitor to Arden, Scott Nearing, brought the game back to Philadelphia, where he used it as a teaching tool in his course on economics at the Wharton School. Nearing's brother was an Arden resident. Mary Pylon tells us that Nearing and others began to refer to the game as the Monopoly game. Meanwhile, Lizzie's version of the landlord's game continued to sell commercially, even as many individuals made their own versions of the game, modifying the rules to make the game more exciting. Early in 1923, Lizzie decided to update her patent and revise some of the game's features. She was living in Chicago and so added Lakeshore Drive to the board, as well as George Street and Fells Avenue. At Columbia University, the economics professor Rexford Tugwell began using the landlord's game in his classes. Tugwell had studied under Scott Nearing at Wharton. At Williams College, a young man named Daniel Lehman learned the Monopoly game from two other students. In 1931, two years after graduating, he came up with his own modified version of the game, called it Finance, and found a company to produce it. Most of the games in circulation had no written rules, but the game Lehman produced came with a rule book. Why did he call the game Finance rather than Monopoly? Mary Pylon explains. Lehman chose to name his game Finance largely because some attorney friends advised him against using the word Monopoly. That name was already in informal use for a game being played in Indiana, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts, they said, and therefore could not be patented or marketed. The story of the spread of the game of Monopoly now centers on Atlantic City, New Jersey, and a small group of Quakers residing there. In 1929, a young woman named Ruth Hopkins arrived in Atlantic City to teach at the Friends School. With her, she brought a version of the Monopoly game she made in Indianapolis after learning the game from Friends. The Quakers in Atlantic City began to come together for regular games of Monopoly. One of the women began making copies for others. A man named Jesse Rayford came up with the idea of using small wooden boxes as houses and to link the properties in color-coded groups of three. Streets were renamed to match Atlantic City neighborhoods. Then in the fall of 1932, Jesse Rayford was visited by his brother who lived in Philadelphia. The game went with him when he and his wife returned home. They soon began holding Monopoly parties with friends and other family members. Among these friends were Charles and Olive Todd. Both families resided in the Emlyn Arms Apartments located in the West Mount Airy section of Philadelphia. Sometime later, the Todds invited an old childhood friend, Esther Jones and her husband, Charles Darrow, to their home for an evening learning how to play the game of Monopoly. Not long thereafter, 
Charles Darrow came up with the game of Monopoly all by himself. He had even managed to get Charles Todd to provide him with a written set of rules to the game. It was Charles Darrow, who may never have traveled to Atlantic City, who misspelled Marvin Garden. With the assistance of an artist friend, a friend never compensated for his contributions, Darrow produced this round board, which he copyrighted in 1933. He then submitted the game to the two major game companies in the United States, Milton Bradley and Parker Brothers. They rejected the game. Soon thereafter, new management took over at Parker Brothers, led by Robert Barton the founder's son-in-law and a graduate of Harvard University. Meanwhile, FAO Schwartz added the game of Monopoly to its catalog. Prodded by his daughter, Robert Barton invited Charles Darrow in for a meeting. Parker Brothers agreed to purchase the rights to produce the game for $7,000 plus a royalty for each copy of the game sold. Nearly 300,000 games were sold during the first year, and in 1936, 1 1.7 million games were purchased. Not everyone was pleased with the written rules. Mary Pylan found a letter from one Monopoly player who wrote to Parker Brothers as follows. Do you idiots know how to play this game, or are you trying to disrupt homes and destroy families with your damn rules? Lawyers at Parker Brothers then discovered the game had both predecessors and competitors. The company filed for a patent on August 31, 1935, which was issued at the end of the year. Parker Brothers lawyers also discovered the 1904 patent issued to Lizzie McGee, now Phillips, for the landlord's game. The now elderly George Parker traveled to Arlington, Virginia to meet with her. He paid her $500 for her patent rights and promised to also produce and market the landlord's game as well as two other games she created. This new version of the landlord's game with Lizzie's image on the box cover appeared in 1939. The public was not interested, as Mary Pylon explains. Much to Lizzie McGee's dismay, the other two games that she invented for Parker Brothers received little publicity and faded into board game obscurity. Her newer, Parker Brothers version of the Landlord's Game appeared to have as well, and so did Lizzie McGee. Finally accepting that the landlord's game would not become the change agent she had once hoped for, in 1940 she reflected on the challenge faced by the followers of Henry George, writing, What is the value of our philosophy if we do not do our utmost to apply it? To simply know a thing is not enough. To merely speak or write of it occasionally among ourselves is not enough. We must do something about it on a large scale if we are to make headway. These are critical times, and drastic action is needed. To make any worthwhile impression on the multitude, we must go in droves into the sacred precincts of the men we are after. We must not only tell them, but show them just how and why and where our claims can be proven in some actual situation. Parker Brothers seemed to have tied up all the loose ends. Then in 1973, an economics professor named Ralph Onspach, who embraced free market ideals, decided to create a game that would teach how free markets actually function. He called his game Anti-Monopoly. Parker Brothers responded with the threat of a lawsuit. Ralph Onschbach then began a 10-year defense of his right to produce anti-monopoly against overwhelming odds and heavy debt. Gradually, painfully, the full history of the origins of the game of Monopoly came to light. He put the story into a book published in 1998. In 1975, Parker Brothers decided to try to buy off Ralph Onschbach.
General Mills offered to make Ralph an executive in its games division, which now clearly included its Parker Brothers acquisition, and to give him more than $500,000 plus damages. In exchange, he had to hand over the production of Anti-Monopoly. Turning down the offer, Anschbach went to court. Twice, the same judge ruled in favor of Parker Brothers. Ralph was ordered to turn over all unsold games to Parker Brothers, which promptly had them buried in a Minnesota landfill. Later, a housing development was constructed over the site. In the summer of 1982, the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit overturned the lower court decision. The evidence presented by Ansbach clearly showed that Monopoly had been in the public domain for decades and that Charles Darrow was not the game's creator. Mary Pylon describes the outcome. Parker Brothers reportedly entered into a series of six-figure settlements with Ralph that exceeded his legal fees and the costs associated with the loss of his 40,000 anti-Monopoly games. These settlements more than doubled the settlement offer that Ralph had turned down years earlier and had far more beneficial terms, including ensuring that anti-monopoly stayed on the market. Elizabeth McGee Phillips is largely a forgotten historical figure. Mary Pylon has given her something more than a footnote in the history books. Perhaps the landlord's game and the principles behind its design will, as a result, attract new attention. <laughs>